Okay, this video is the new uh, Dr. Dean Ornish Dementia Reversal Study, a randomized control trial. It has not been published yet. It's going to be published in June, so very soon. Um, the reason I know about it is there was a feature about it on CNN that was on um, Instagram, and, um, you know, that's pretty impressive. You know, he's got a lot of connections. He's super famous, and he's done a lot of big-time research in the past. He did a randomized control trial showing that uh, coronary artery disease could be uh, controlled or partially reversed in some cases. Um, and then he also did the study showing uh, about telomere shortening could be controlled. Um, that's the one he did with Blackburn, Elizabeth Blackburn. She's a lady that won a Nobel Prize for uh, her telomere research. And he also did the study showing that prostate cancer could be controlled and PSA even lowered in a lot of patients, all with a vegetarian or a vegan diet. And he would often include a little bit of stress management along the lines of yoga and meditation. <clears throat> and I kind of think yoga and meditation is really weak, kind of BS, you know. Um, but, <clears throat> you know, that's something you could do in a secular research journal. Plus, you know, if he had told them do Christianity, they would never invite him on CNN. Not in a million years. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> if you want to get, you know, accepted into that type of area, you have to talk about stuff like yoga and meditation. And, you know, I never forgot that Ashok, the ruler, uh, conqueror of India, told everybody, you know, do Buddhism and meditate, you know, sit there, talk to yourself and say Om to the wall because it pacifies people. But anyways, uh, there's some good stuff here. He, <clears throat> let's see, it sounds like a very promising way to motivate people. And here's what I think is funny. Normally, <clears throat> you cannot get attention in the big media for something about diet and lifestyle, okay? The only thing they'll publicize is things that don't work, like the phony Mediterranean diet. You know, he somehow has big enough connections that he can get into the mainstream, which is good because it gets all of a uh, plant-based diet into the mainstream. Okay, um, and then the question arises, well, why he claims that there were some patients who were even able to at least partially reverse their dementia. Okay, um, and so what were the things that he did? They changed from, you know, uh, the typical lousy diet most Americans eat, which most of them were probably eating the standard American diet. A lot of meat, oils, processed foods. All of that stuff is, is neurotoxic one way or the other. Uh, so somebody asked me, a viewer asked me, well, why do you think Ornish uh, might have had this success? Okay, and here, so here's a couple thoughts. I, this is just what immediately occurred to me. I'm sure there's a bunch more. I, I just thought about this in five minutes. Okay, number one, the meat animals are are high on the food chain, the meat eaters. Well, excuse me, the animals that we eat for meat. So let's say a cow or whatever, the chickens. And they're going to be fed a lot of pesticide sprayed food. A lot of them eat GMO sprayed corn. And what do they spray on corn? They spray atrazine, which is neurotoxic. It's a mitochondrial inhibitor of complex 3. It's estrogenic. Most estrogenic chemicals are neurotoxic, about 80% of them. Um... Let's see what else. Hexane is used if there's a soy that's used on processed soy, and that's very common in processed food. Soy is the, the standard subsidized cheap source of protein for processed food. Uh, corn is the cheap source of sugar for processed food with high fructose corn syrup. The high fructose corn syrup here, number six, is uh, very routinely processed through like a chloralkali vat and that puts mercury into it, which is popular actually in processed food companies because it's a preservative. Estrogenic chemicals are often preservatives. Estrogen chemicals are fed to the, the livestock because it makes them get fat and they grow faster. Okay. Um, Let's see, what else? Um, when, you, when you feed people a plant-based diet, the, the dietary fiber stabilizes the intestinal barrier, and the same short-chain fatty acids like dibutyrate that stabilizes the intestinal barrier, it also goes through the blood and it stabilizes the blood-brain barrier. When you stabilize the blood-brain barrier, the person has, is better able to control their extracellular matrix within their brain, their brain tissue, their brain parenchyma. What does that mean? That means the neurons will have a better... Uh, plasma membrane gradients, electrochemical gradients, and they can function better. They will have less brain fog because you need to have good uh, plasma membrane ionic gradients, electrochemical gradients, in order to optimize neuronal function, avoid brain fog, avoid cognitive impairment. Um, what else? 
mold inhibitors. Processed food puts tons of mold inhibitors. Imagine you're running a fast food place. You got all this stuff sitting on the shelf. If it spoils, you lose all that money. So you got to have it uh, a long shelf half-life. And so they put tons of fungal inhibitors. Well, guess what? Fungal inhibitors are mitochondrial inhibitors. In general, mitochondrial inhibitors tend to be neurotoxins because you need to make tons of ATP in order to pump calcium out of your cytoplasm and not become vulnerable to excitotoxicity. So it's pretty understandable. Processed food, fast food sitting on shelves uh, is going to have lots of preserves in it. Not to mention it's going to have lots of sodium in it. Sodium is a preservative and it's also, of course, it's a flavor and it tastes good. It gets you to eat more. In addition, processed foods to get you to eat more, they'll have a lot of MSG and especially nowadays MFG, manufactured free glutamate, which just comes from processing a protein, chopping it up into pieces so that the individual glutamates become more free. Glutamate is an amino acid. It's also an excitotoxin and you can overwhelm the body's ability to you know, regulate it and, and sort of sequester it because there are going to be tons of MSG in these foods. Okay, it's also an obesogen. You put, you feed MSG and you put it in food to make animals eat more and make them fat. It also makes humans fat. Okay, um, and it's also an excitotoxin. Okay, um, it causes increased activation of NMDA receptors in the brain, letting more calcium into cells, thus overexciting brain cells, neurons. Okay, saturated fat is a well-known diabetogen causing diabetes, inhibiting electron transport in the intermitochondrial membrane. So that's all bad. You can see how bad all this stuff is. Thing, the brain needs tons of energy, ATP production. ATP, adenosine triphosphate, is the energy currency of a brain cell. Okay, And you need to make tons of it. So anything that inhibits mitochondria is bad for the brain. Okay, And sad fat causing diabetes is basically a metabolic disaster. All right. Um, let's see, what else? Um, when you eat more plant foods, you will increase your intake of potassium and magnesium. Well, potassium and magnesium are both vasodilators. The typical American is eating way too much sodium and not enough potassium and magnesium. And for an obvious reason, they don't eat hardly any plants. And the potassium and the magnesium come from plants. Magnesium is located right in the center of chlorophyll. So when you eat the plants, you get magnesium. You need magnesium you know, to stabilize your ATPs. The reason why ATP is such a powerful energy molecule is because it has adenosine triphosphate, three phosphates. And the phosphates have a big negative charge on them. They want to bust away from each other. But the positive charge of the magnesium stabilizes those phosphates until the enzyme that they're um, connected to lets that phosphate be released, you know, moves the magnesium away. So you need magnesium in order for ATP to work. And most Americans are magnesium deficient. Most of them are potassium deficient. That's why they tend to be hypertensive fat with poor arterial circulation. And the arter poor arterial circulation relates to brain hypoxia. So what I'm also saying here is when you eat a vegetarian diet, preferably a low-fat vegan diet, you get much better blood supply to your brain because you avoid the high-fat component, which decreases oxygen delivery to the brain. And you're avoiding the sodium, which is a vasoconstrictor, decreases oxygen delivery to the brain. When brain cells get more oxygen, they're more able to make ATP, which means they're more able to function normally. When they get enough potassium and magnesium, they can maintain their plasma membrane ionic gradients, um, electrochemical gradients. It's electric in the sense that you have a charge differential across the plasma membrane and neurons, typically about negative 65, negative 70 millivolts, plus you um, also will have a sodium gradient, for example. You'll have a 10 to 1 sodium gradient, about 140 outside the cell and about 14 inside the cell. And you use that, you couple things to the movement of sodium uh, to run your ion pumps, like your NACA exchanger, sodium calcium um, exchanger, so you can pump calcium out of the cell. Okay, so what I'm basically saying is in order to function correctly, a neuron needs oxygen to make ATP, and then it needs potassium and magnesium to run its plasma membrane ion pumps to maintain its gradients because almost all of its work depends on that. Typically, about uh, you know at least half to two-thirds of the ATP in a neuron is going to be used to run that potassium-sodium uh, pump, ion pump. And so plant-based diet gives you exactly what you need to run those pumps and gives you good oxygenation in your cells so you function better. Plants also provide antioxidants. You know, what are the major theories of neuronal degeneration? They include destruction of mitochondria, excitotoxicity. And what causes that? 
high fat diets and hypoxia, lack of oxygen, okay? And oxidative stress. So plants are where you get antioxidants. You know, plants have antioxidants because they have to survive out in the sun and they cannot run under a tree to get shade unlike an animal can. Okay, you eat an animal, it's used up as antioxidants, almost all of them. Okay, there's also something called the Hawthorne effect, which simply means that you have a bunch of old people. Usually, you know, old people are pretty neglected, especially if they're in a nursing home or something with Alzheimer's. And, you know, they're kind of just sit there waiting to die. And when a person's lonely and ignored, they feel kind of sad. And that decreases their energy, their enthusiasm, their motivation. So what I'm basically saying is the Hawthorne effect means when you study people, put them in a research study, you start paying attention to them, talking to them, educating, spending time with them, encouraging them. It motivates them to try harder and it makes them happier. They perk up. They're, and that'll improve their cognitive function to some degree. But, you know, it was a randomized controlled trial. So we don't have the published paper yet. And I don't know exactly how the patients were handled and what exactly the difference was between the control and the, um, the vegan uh, vegetarian diet patients. But that, the, the gist of it, the Hawthorne effect has an effect. Um, exercise also promotes neurogenesis which means the formation of neuro, new neurons. There's also such a thing as synaptogenesis, the you know modification of synapses, formation of new synapses, uh, connections between neurons. So you could have two established neurons that now form a connection. That's synaptogenesis. Neurogenesis would be to form an entirely new neuron. Actually, exercise does more than that because he had his patients exercise. He had them exercise at least a half an hour to an hour, three times a week or more if they wanted, apparently was what I, uh, what I got from the CNN interview that he did. So he was interviewed on CNN, Dr. Ornish. Um, exercise does a lot more than that. Exercise actually is one of the fastest, best things a person can do to improve brain function. And I think the reason is the purpose, you know, why do animals have brains but plants do not? Because animals move. As soon as you move, you have to do a lot of things. You have to make a value judgment. What is your destination? I shall walk towards the fruit tree. I am hungry. I shall avoid the danger on that other side over there. There's a bunch of coyotes. Okay. You also increase the the blood supply to your brain cells when you exercise. You you generate something called angiogenesis, the formation of new blood vessels in a good way to improve oxygen delivery to the tissues. You also get something called uh, mitochondrial biogenesis, meaning that you will form more mitochondria in response to demonstrating a need for it by your exercise. And as soon as you exercise, you activate the brain. Because again, besides choosing a destination, you then have to navigate your way to the destination. You have to avoid Avoid obstacles in your path. You have to remember where you came from so you can get back over there. Um, so it, it inquires a lot of cognitive function, and that gets back to the idea of Moravec's paradox, whereby the artificial intelligence robot programmers and stuff found out that the easy problem is hard, the hard problem is easy. And what that means is they thought it would be difficult to make a, a brain think, you know, like to do calculus, like a real complicated thing like that. But they could figure that out in the one in the 1950s. Whereas they're only beginning to have robots that can move similar to humans. It's much more complicated to have a person move in a coordinated fashion than it is to have them do mathematics, okay? Um, so what I'm saying is when you exercise, you activate tons of neurons. And you like say, well, what's probably one of the most engaging uh, neurologic activities? Well, that would probably be something like dancing because you need to use a lot of physical coordination, listening to the beat, and socially interact with another person. And they've had Parkinson patients, for example, who found that was very helpful to them to be in like a square dance class or something. Okay, um, other things that will increase the likelihood that you can help patients with this. Uh, healthy diet and exercise will enable reduction in medications. Many of these medications will have side effects, including cognitive side effects. For example, metformin is a mitochondrial inhibitor. That's why I always laugh at people who ask me, oh, is metformin going to help me live longer and be healthier? I heard it might, some study. I'm like, yeah, right. You're not going to improve your health by inhibiting your mitochondria. Statins are also mitochondrial inhibitor through coenzyme Q. Metformin is complex one. Uh, serotonin selective reuptake inhibitors can <laughs> inhibit two of the different complexes in mitochondrial electron transport on the intermitochondrial membrane. But for chumps, I was laughing. I saw this article about Prozac being recommended for chemotherapy. <laughs> what a joke. Okay, Tylenol is also a mitochondrial inhibitor. It's also liver toxic too, hepatotoxic as well. All these things are mitochondrial inhibitors. Anything that inhibits mitochondria is going to decrease ATP production, which is going to decrease the ability of that neuron to pump calcium out of its cytoplasm, which is going to increase the risk of excitotoxicity. I made the point, you know, that 
Mitochondria inhibitors essentially are excitotoxins. And excitotoxicity, I think, is one of the main ways that brain cells are dying, leading to apoptosis of brains. Because what I see when I look at all these demented brains, and I've seen thousands of them, is I typically see an atrophic brain. I'll sometimes see some peri, you know, ventricular small flare hyperintensities like small strokes, silent strokes, okay? I'll sometimes see a big stroke, but usually not. Most of the time I see just a few, you know, incidental, almost irrelevant really, periventricular silent strokes. And the money is the brain is shrunken, atrophic from extensive apoptosis. What else? Processed foods have a lot of food dyes in them. These are often mitochondria inhibitors. Um, when you're eating meat and processed food, they tend to be, you know, processed foods are often re, uh, in so-called enriched, fortified with iron. So they're high in iron. And the meat is, of course, especially red meat, is high in iron. And that will um, cause more oxidative stress. I wrote lowers oxidative stress right here. That was a mistake. They increase oxidative stress. And iron can even have its whole own mechanism of disease. It can have uh, ferroptosis, uh, which is sort of uh, iron-induced apoptosis. It can also be coupled with lipid peroxidation. Omega-6 cooking oils, which are relatively ubiquitous in a lot of processed food and fried food, those are a major contributor to dementia as well. And the big uh, theory on that comes from this uh, Dr. Tetsumori Yamashima, Japanese doctor, and it's also called the calpain cathepsin theory of neurodegeneration. Basically, omega-6 oils are, uh, they become rancid, undergo lipid peroxidation, produce toxic aldehydes like hydroxynanonol, and these are quite neurotoxic, and it's also an inhibitor of mitochondrial electron transfer. So what I'm trying to say is there's lots of reasons why going on a vegan diet will protect the brain, and I think it's great that Ornish is able to get into the mainstream uh, publicity uh, channels. You know, I'll make the best video ever made in the history of the world on neurodegeneration, and I'll get 200 views, okay? This study is on CNN and is going to be made widely known to people. So I'm amazed he's able to get that across. Because usually, think about it. You've got all, you know, over the last 50 years, hundreds of billions of dollars have been spent on research on cancer, atherosclerosis, uh, diabetes, hypertension. And it's all a joke. Okay, it's all a joke because all they're trying to do is sell drugs. That's why conventional medicine never cures anything. It's almost like a comic book. You know, they're a joke. They'll call non-conventional medicine, they'll call people quacks, but it's actually the vegans who cure it. Vegan diet cures hypertension, coronary artery disease, diabetes all the time, routinely. Okay, don't get me wrong, sometimes it can't. So once there's chronic irreversible damage, you can't cure it. Once you wipe out all your pancreas uh, beta cells, you, you're, you're, you need insulin. You're, you're never going to change that. Okay, once you've destroyed all your arteries from hypertension, you're never going to, you know, completely reverse that with a plant diet. And, you know, same, similar other things with these other chronic diseases. But the point is, most people caught early enough, sometimes even after decades, can reverse these things. So, anyways, I thought this was rather dramatic big news. The Dean Ornish Dementia Reversal Study coming out in a journal, some Alzheimer's journal in June. Uh, so, seems interesting. Promising.